Gentlemen, we have called you together to inform you that we are going to overthrow the United States government. You still think that jet fuel brought down the World Trade Center? Does anybody else see a problem here? If the government has nothing to hide, why are they so afraid to answer a few questions? Now that the Bill of Rights have been largely destroyed by our corporatized government, President Obama has decided to go for the meat of the American Constitution. The war powers of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11 of the United States Constitution, sometimes referred to as the War Powers Clause, vests in the Congress the power to declare war. This resolution is a total rewrite of the War Powers Clause of the United States Constitution. Let's be clear about that. It is essentially a declaration of international martial law, a sweeping transfer of military power to the president that will allow him or her to send U.S. troops almost anywhere in the world for almost any reason with absolutely no limitations. So while the East Coast was buried under record snowfall, Obama's faux Republican minions, Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell, scuttled another dangerous fast-track bill into the halls of the most hated Congress in U.S. history. The legislation makes the unconstitutional Iraq War authorization of 2002 look like a walk in the park. It will allow this president and future presidents to wage war against ISIS without restrictions on time, geographic scope, or the use of ground troops. It is a completely open-ended authorization for the president to use the military as he wishes for as long as he or she wishes. Even President Obama has expressed concern over how willing Congress is to hand him unlimited power to wage war. The Foreign Relations Committee, whose chair, Senator Bob Corker, suggested that a new authorization for use of military force was unlikely to happen and that President Obama currently has the legal authority he needs. Corker's authority was bypassed by McConnell's treasonous fast track. And Senator Lindsey Graham bleated out to reporters, if the Democrats don't want to give this to Obama, then stand up and tell me why. There may be some people running for president as Republicans who don't want this. I would be astonished that anybody seeking to be commander in chief wouldn't want this power. It would allow the administration to fight the terror group ISIS wherever, whenever, and however. As if the real threat of ISIS was a mystery to the American people. Most Americans are fully aware that our greatest threat lies in Obama's policies regarding immigration. The bill isn't even warm yet, and Vice President Joe Biden is in Turkey cheerleading World War III, presenting both sides of the issue to Turkey and the American people. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. The Turks were great friends, and I have a great relationship with Erdogan, which I've just spent a lot of time with. They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens, thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad. Except that the people who were being, who were being supplied were al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world. Following World War II, the United States leadership has continually sought to foment and drive the industrial military complex machine into an unending unconstitutional state of global war, creating the very enemies Obama's dictatorial powers would seek to suppress. We have finally reached the precipice of the total annihilation of the balance of powers that act as the foundation of our republic. Let's not get involved in constitutional arguments. President Obama is desperately attempting to disarm the public and re-engineer the United States into a lawless military state overseen by corrupt politicians on par with the horror south of our border. John Bound for Infowars.com. Good evening, my fellow Americans. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Three of these involved our own country. 
But threats, new in kind or degree, constantly arise. Of these I mention two only. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime, or indeed by the fighting men of World War II or Korea. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national defense. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. We annually spend on military security alone more than the net income of all United States corporation, corporations. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. Gentlemen, we have called you together to inform you that we are going to overthrow the United States government. Still think that jet fuel brought down the World Trade Center? Does anybody else see a problem here? If the government has nothing to hide, why are they so afraid to answer a few questions? This story does not add up.
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The title of this report is A Satirist's Dream, Closing the Gap Between Anti-Corruption Law and Reality. I could fill my 60 seconds talking about the 18 years' worth of unaudited accounts or the bazillions that are squandered on uh, agriculture and foreign aid boondoggles or the Tillac case where instead of any of the alleged fraudsters being arrested, it was the journalist uh, trying to find out about them who found himself banged up by the police. I could talk about the 6.6 .6 million pounds spent last year by European commissioners simply on entertainment and luxury gifts and hotels. I could talk about the uh, wonderful spectacle of President Van Rompuy and uh, Commissioner Ashton flying to the same meeting in Russia from in separate private jets leaving Brussels within four hours of each other. Instead I'll confine myself to saying this. These things happen not because the EU attracts particularly bad people. I mean, of course, it attracts some bad people. Man is fallen, and like all institutions, it contains those who give in to temptation. It happens rather because there is no link between taxation, representation, and expenditure at Brussels level. It was Milton Friedman who said there's two kinds of money in the world. There's your money, and there's my money. The trouble is that in the EU, it's all your money. Hence, negligence, corruption, fraud, and what, uh, and what we see before us today. Mr. Uh, Co-President Nigel Farage, Freedom and Democracy. Well, good morning, Mr. Van Rompuy. You've been in office for one year, and in that time, the whole edifice is beginning to crumble. Uh, there's chaos. Uh, the money's running out. I should thank you. You should perhaps be the pin-up boy of the Eurosceptic movement. But just look around this chamber this morning. Just look at these faces. Look at the fear. Look at the anger. Poor old Barroso here looks like he's seen a ghost. You know, they're beginning to understand that the game is up, and yet in their desperation to preserve their dream, they want to remove any remaining traces of democracy from the system. And it's pretty clear that none of you have learned anything. You know, when you yourself, Mr. Van Rompuy, say that the euro has brought us stability, I suppose I could applaud you for having a sense of humour, but isn't this really just the bunker mentality? You know, your fanaticism is out in the open. You talked about the fact that it was a lie to believe that the nation state could exist in a 21st century globalised world. Well, that may be true in the case of Belgium, who haven't had a government for six months, but for the rest of us, right across every member state in this union, and perhaps this is why we see the fear in the faces, increasingly people are saying, we don't want that flag, we don't want the anthem, we don't want this political class. We want the whole thing consigned to the dustbin of history. And we had the Greek tragedy 
earlier on this year and now we have the situation in ireland. now i know that the stupidity and greed of irish politicians has a lot to do with this. they should never ever have joined the euro they suffered with low interest rates a false boom and a massive bust but look at your response to them. what they are being told as their governments collapsing is that it would be inappropriate for them to have a general election. in fact commissioner Wren here said they had to agree their budget first before they would be allowed to have a general election. just who the hell do you think you people are? you are very very dangerous people indeed. your obsession with creating this euro state means that you are happy to destroy democracy. you appear to be happy for millions and millions of people to be unemployed and to be poor. untold millions must suffer so that your euro dream can continue. well it will not work because it is Portugal next with their debt levels of 325 per cent of GDP. they are the next ones on the list and after that I suspect it will be Spain and the bailout for Spain would be seven times the size of Ireland and at that moment all of the bailout money has gone. there will not be any more. But it's even more serious than economics because if you rob people of their identity, if you rob them of their democracy, then all they are left with is nationalism and violence. I can only hope and pray that the Euro project is destroyed by the markets before that really happens. Thank you. They cannot create the world of Orwell. They have to manipulate us to create it. And what they're doing all the time, and a lot of this stuff in the movies, which are feeding you what they want to happen, look at all the movies over the last like decade or so, more and more now all the time, that are portraying this very police state and this very Orwellian fascist uh, Agenda 21 world that I've been talking about. They're doing that for a reason. It's to implant that in the subconscious so it becomes reality through humans' uh, creative imagination. They have to get us to do it. Number one, the fascist global state is not coming because we're not fricking having it anymore. And we are not any longer going to be manipulated into manifesting our own enslavement. And when they tell us to be quiet, we shout bloody louder. Silence is consent. Can you hear us now? If you want to be free, then don't run and hide. This is a time for looking the world in the bloody eye. Together. Coming together. Strength does not come from physical capacity, it comes from indomitable will, Mahatma Gandhi. And that will, that will says we are not having it anymore. Human race, get off your knees. What are you doing down there? Hey! The whole enterprise is crazy and it's an absolute scam which is going to cost you a great deal. It's rather like paying monkeys because what happens is the civil servants draw up the list and if it's vote number 58 and the piece of paper says vote yes, you vote yes.